Okay, people, one and all, welcome. This is our 72nd Future Leaders Group. Welcome, everyone, from wherever you are. We have a nice small group today, so I'm hoping for some deep divings into um, things, and I'd love to get people's opinion on stuff as well. Um, we, For those listening that have never listened before, uh, we set up Future Leaders because we truly think that this isn't this not only the greatest transference of wealth we've ever seen, but there is a... Um, in our opinion, a great need for a deeper sense of sovereignty for people, sovereignty of yourselves, ownership of yourselves, ownership of your finances, ownership of your relationship in general, more ownership and responsibility for people. And money, I love it or hate it, is a really beautiful inflection point into life. And um, often things are mirrors, you know, so how we, whatever's going on inside, we'll see outside in your business, in your relationships, in your finances, whatever. Um, and the two greatest things people will seek the most in life is to save money and to save time. Um, so at the minute, me and Richard can't help you save too much time, uh, but we can help you save a little bit of money, which maybe might give you a little bit more time. Who knows? And so we have future leaders as, as that central crux. Uh, crypto runs through it all, um, but all the way around it is kind of like all these deeper and more meaningful things. But we use, we use money and crypto and finance as the, as the anchor. So we haven't got anyone new on this call. Uh, we do have Paul, who's been joining us for the last couple. We've got Louise, Rod, and Alan, as ever. So before we crack in, I would love um, if there's anything people particularly want to discuss. Now, I know from the questions, um, we've got uh, Louise, you brought up a really good question around MetaMask and Sort. Uh, so me and Richard are having a chat about that. So we're going we're gonna to expand that out into like, APIs and connectivity and I suppose a bit more of the practical applications of how you work in crypto. Um, Elaine, really, she wrote down everything. Not too sure. Not too sure what we're going to do with that. I was hoping she'd be on here. Um, Paul, uh, you want to know about BTC mining. Can you just expand that a little bit? Um, so like the full question, if I was allowed to ask it, would be would be this would be um, you will have no doubt have seen like um, plan B's modeling and he does like some really interesting interviews. I really like his stuff. Um, I was I was sent some data from a different um, from a different source today, like a highly reputable source that like they're modeling out. A crypto bull market between October and December of this year and you know they've provided lots of data and it looks reasonably compelling um, so I suppose the first question would be you know do you have any thoughts about his modeling leading into that um, and, and like the second part of that would be how do you think the publicly listed miners might respond to that you know so the you know riot uh, marathon etc argo i mean argo seems to be struggling for reasons I, I don't know much about the company but you know how do you think they will behave you know um last time around like it was orders of magnitude you know btc times by four riot times by 10 you know, mara times by 20 it was like quite i'd never seen anything like it and then i suppose the third part of the question if it's not being like too self-indulgent is and then the anticipation is we're going to go through a couple of years of crypto winter. <clears throat> and we've talked previously about yield, just any particular comments you've got on Anchor uh, and any particular comments that you've got on the promotion that kind of compass mining or, off, off, or like putting out through the YouTube influencers, and whether you think it's worth exploring that during the crypto winter, basically. Brilliant. Well, just, just so you know, unless there is a character count when you enter those questions, you have full permission to, let's say, A4. I don't want to read more than an A4 piece. Um, but yeah, no, you're perfectly welcome to ask everything. So they're really, really good. So I'm going to summarize that. We have a question around what do we think of Plan B? Yeah. And also for anyone who doesn't know, what's Plan B? Um, it's not the alternative to Plan A. Um, in this context. The second question then is publicly listed companies who mine, if BTC goes up, how, uh, this is what I think you're inferring, how will that affect the price of that publicly listed company? Yeah. Yeah. And then the third question is when it comes to winter, what do we think about Anchor? 
and compass mining and basically earning yield through winter. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, 100%. Cool. Uh, just to see, there's only two people on camera, Louise and Rod. Are you interested in any of those questions? Yeah? Then you're not, then it's not self-indulgent, Paul. Okay. Very, it's very hard to ask a self-indulgent question because it's far too easy for someone else to be like, that's a good question. I didn't know that, or I have that same question, but I didn't even know it. Cool. Thank you, Paul. Um, and Rod, did you have your hand up because you wanted something to discuss? Or you put it in the chat, haven't you? Uh, no, I was just saying, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with Paul's questions. And I don't understand most of it, but I'm really interested to hear what the answer is going to be. Um, cool. and, um, well, welcome to crypto. <laughs> and uh, I wondered if we might have time just to talk a little bit about the tax situation. Cool. That is a better wording of your question versus what you put in the chat, because obviously um, how not to pay it is a is a um, would never and can never endorse that whatsoever. Tax evasion is illegal. However, what we can do is we can be efficient uh, and we can set up things to pay minimal tax. So it's always really good with when discussing tax to um, um, word things correctly. That's all. So yeah, I, um, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I absolutely love words. I've been using them most of my life. Um, <laughs> but, I, <clears throat> but I think that um, um, evasion and avoidance um, um, both fit into the category of not paying tax. And I chose obviously the legal one. Perfect. Okay. So. Um, then what we will do is what we got here then api connectivity we've got the model anchor okay so we've got four four points then really haven't we we've got um apis we have got um let's say btc future in particular plan b plus um, uh, public companies. Uh, we've got winter and earning, and we've got tax. Cool. They're going to be the four anchors, um, no pun intended, of what we're kind of covered today. We'll do our best to get through them all. I'm just wondering, Richard, is it best to maybe split one out? I feel like the winter and the earning, just because we've covered it a lot, Paul, mm -hmm. I'm going to put that to the last. If we've got a chance to put comment on it, um, we yeah. will. But we've covered a lot of um, uh, earning yield over the last two calls. Okay. Um, but there's a few things I'd want to share. So at least when you leave this call, you've got yeah. some different perspectives to do, do some research on it. Um, so API and BTC will definitely do. Tax, always a good one. Happy to bring that in, Rod, and then we'll see where we get to. Awesome. Um, so... Louise says, I set up MetaMask wallet and to, I want to be able to use it with Zort. How do I connect this to my Binance account? Louise, in, so that people are listening, uh, does anybody not know what MetaMask is? Paul, all right. Uh, then let's just cover that really quickly. Um, the reason I really like this question, by the way, is on our, we're trying to link things back now to this, uh, the nine week course that we're, that we're doing. And a lot of that question really brings in wallets and exchanges and the difference between them so for paul here for anyone listening metamask is a browser extension wallet what do i mean by that with the advent of things like chrome like applications on your computer started to change a little bit instead of installing a piece of software you installed a browser extension but that browser extension is a whole different ecosystem compared to the browser itself you could argue it's, it is a piece of software, but it runs inside the browser. So uh, MetaMask is a wallet, but instead of it being software on your computer, it's an extension and it sits inside you, your browser. What that enables is something called Web 3.0. And Web 3, in Web 2.0, me and the internet have a relationship. Um, in Web 3.0, there's a third party. So I'm on a website, me, somebody else, or the website. And the website says, hey, um, you need to pay. But if that website works with MetaMask, my MetaMask will pop up and say, do you want me to pay it? And I'll say, yeah, <laughs> paid, done. So it's a, that's one example using finance of what Web 3.0 is. It's a third layer interface of the internet. 
and there's relationships between all three. So MetaMask is a, is a wallet browser extension um, and it's a private wallet. So you have your own keys for it, but it's still a hot wallet. Louise or Rod or anyone, what's a hot wallet compared to a cold wallet? A hot wallet is one that's like on the internet, like you don't physically kind of hold, whereas you can have like a cold wallet key that kind of looks a bit like a USB stick and you can you carry that with you, whereas the hot wallet's like virtual. I wish we had a point scoring system on here. <laughs> or those little gold stars that you can get at the dentist. Perfect. Cold wallets are cold. It's a technical term. When things are hot, they're connected. And when they're cold, they're disconnected um, from like network engineers and stuff. So a hot wallet means it's on your computer. It's live. It's connected to the internet and cold. You know, if I unplug my cold wallet and hold it in my hand, nobody can hack it because it's in my hand. Um, so MetaMask, that's what it is. Um, and the reasons you might use it and there's two big ones. The first one is when we look at exchanges and you've got decentralized exchanges and centralized. Decentralized, you log in and you put your money on it. Binance, Coinbase, Crypto.com. You know, these are huge companies with money sat in them. A decentralized exchange has nothing connected to it other than the people that are connecting their wallets to it. So there's no inherent, there can be, you can choose to, put some of your money in a liquidity pool, but it's very different to a centralized exchange. So if you want to work on things like pancake swap, sushi swap, burger swap, um, uh, uni swap, a lot of food related swap sites, or we won't get into why uh, they just are, um, they all are decentralized. And so you, they, when you log on to them, it will say, you need a wallet and you'll say connect and a list of, of decentralized usually browser extension wallets will appear and you'll say, oh, I have a MetaMask wallet. And then when you click it, it'll pop up. MetaMask will pop up and say, this sushi swap site is trying to talk to me. Are you okay with that? And you'll say, yes. And at that point now, you're now able to trade your funds. Paul, because you didn't know in this instance, how much sense does that make? That makes complete sense. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, it's really helpful. Cool. So we know that MetaMask is a wallet that sits in your browser and it connects to websites that are decentralized for the most part. Everything I say has caveats. This is crypto. There's no set thing, but for the most part, and then you can trade your money. So that and, and built into MetaMask is a swap facility for a small fee. And MetaMask goes out to all of the decentralized sites finds the best price and brings it you back, but charges you a bit for it. So even if you didn't want to go and do all the connectivity, you could do that. However, that is not Louise's question. Because Louise's question is the second reason people use MetaMask. Um, and she hasn't wrote it in, written it, wrote it. She hasn't said it in the question, um, but she said, how do I use my MetaMask with Zort? Zort is one example, Paul, of your crypto winter question. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, and so she's choosing to use Zort, and now she wants to connect it to MetaMask. Is that because you bought some Zort token, Louise? No. Um, when I went onto the Zort dashboard and like set up an account, and you have to pay like a hundred pound fee initially, don't you, to prove you're not like a scam account, but then you get it back in credit. So when I went to that payment it said like hey using and it had like different cryptos so i i went on and done my payment and then it, the next kind of window when you're actually on the resort dashboard where you need to put your money in to trade it the only option i could see was like connect metamask i couldn't see anything to kind of connect my binance account directly to Zort. okay so I think there's, so then um, I'll answer that question and in answering it, we'll come back to the MetaMask and where that fits into it. Okay. Zort, which is just a, think of it like an AI trading bot for anyone that's not familiar. Um, you don't put your money in Zort, your money's somewhere else and you tell Zort, I give you permission to access this box and you've got three options, 
look at what's in it. We'll call that like reading the information. Um, trade what's in it, withdraw what's in it. And they're the usual three options that you give it. Um, so you're going to connect what's called an API to it. That's effective what you're connecting to it. And that's got nothing to do with MetaMask. And an API, I used to know what it stands for. I've forgotten. But let's just, give, let's just call it permission. And um, Applications programming interface. 10 points. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> when you're connecting up, uh, when you're in Zort, speaking specifically to Louise, um, you're on a new dashboard. If you've paid your 100 have you've already paid your hundred dollars and you're already in, yeah? Yeah. Scroll to the bottom and you're going to see a section that talks about API keys. Um, the only automatic API keys are with Coinbase. If you want to use Binance, you're going to need to speak to tech support. Um, and you're in our Zork group, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, read the FAQ, read how to contact support, and you'll see his little his DM for Telegram. I just DM them and say, uh, I'm a paid member. This is the email address I signed up with. Can you add me to the paid group? And I'd like to set up Binance. Okay. And he has to manually do it. However, you're still going to need an API key. So if everyone remembers for a wallet, um, you for any address, you have a public key, which is what I give you all if you want to send money. And I have a private key, which is what I need to unlock to send money. APIs... I suppose working the same way. You have a, a public key, which is um, th which tells Zor this is where you go to find whatever you need to find, and to access it, you need the uh, the private key or secret key, as they call it. So when you go to Binance, you go to if you click on your little icon for your face, or you'll see an API section, and you'll click create new API, and you create an API for anything that's connecting. Never use the same APIs. So if you're going to track your coins using a software called Coin Tracker, you'll create an API for Coin Tracker. Remember, you'll give it read capabilities because it needs to see what you've got, but you would never give it trading and you would never give it withdrawing capabilities. That's a bad finger to have up. It's because if you um, if someone accidentally got a hold of your public key and secret key and you gave all three permissions, they could literally go in there send your money to their own wallet, coins gone. So APIs are really important. Without the trading capability though? Uh, well, no, obviously I, I'm talking about coin tracker there. For Zort, yeah. you would set up um, read, trade. Yeah. But you Not leave with, well. yeah. But that's why I said always have separate ones. Some people keep the information and use the same key for multiple um, uh, connections. And I'm saying never do that. So mm -hmm. when you're going to Binance, you create a new API, save the information somewhere. Um, there's sometimes a third piece of information called a password. So some just have a public key, secret key. Some have public key, secret key, password. Uh, and at some point when you speak to Binance, uh, Zort, um, they'll send you a secret way to provide that information. Do never give, the, never give those pieces of information to anybody, ever. Think of them like your seed phrase. They're very, very, very important. And if someone at technical support in any space is like, oh, cool, send me across your secret key, like that should bring um, alarm bells. Yeah. So, so I didn't actually what, have to set up a MetaMask, did I? You, you do, because I'm going to come back to that. Because oh, okay. there's a reason it's there. So if you want to set up an API and you want to use Binance, you're going to have to do it manually. For anyone else on any other software, most okay. people that have an API integration, it's all automated. So Coin Tracker, I mentioned earlier, if I click in my coin tracking software, I want to add a Binance account, a screen will come up and it'll say, enter the public key for the Binance account, enter the secret key, save. And now all of a sudden, my Coin Tracker can read what's in my Binance and what's in my crypto.com. Well, not crypto, and here, and here, and here. So in one space, I can see them all. Um, so it's usually automated, but in this unique instance for Louise, it's not. Um, so what on earth has that got to do with MetaMask? Uh, absolutely nothing. 
because what you're trying to achieve, Louise, has nothing to do with MetaMask. However, why is MetaMask there? And this is the second reason people use MetaMask, which is for staking. So Zort, which is a platform, also has a coin called Zort, completely separate. Zort coin could disappear tomorrow. Their platform is their own platform. They charge fees for every trade. They make money. It's a business. Like the difference between Binance and Binance coin. So what Zort, have a Zort coin. And Zort say, obviously Zort owns Zort coin. Like any good coin owner, the more people that stop selling it, the higher the price. The more scarce it is, the higher the price. So they incentivize people. So Zort say, if you buy Zort coin and you lock it in Zort, we'll give you some benefits. We'll give you lesser fees. We'll give you more leverage when you're buying um, power to keep Zort going. Um, and they have a vested interest in that because then the more people are locking up their Zort, the less Zort there is. To lock it up, you send your Zort to MetaMask. You connect your MetaMask to Zort using an API. And then you would give permission to Zort to lock and hold on to that Zort that's in your MetaMask. It never leaves your MetaMask. It's always there, but you've given permission to Zort to hold on to it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does. So that $100 that I put in initially, was that is that now in the form of a Zort coin? No, nope. that is actually called Zort Power. When you log into your platform, you'll see it there. And every time you trade, it'll just take 0.25%. Right, okay. It's nothing, Zort coin and the whole thing about Zort coin and staking and all that and MetaMask is its own little thing. <clears throat> you can operate in Zort, connect to Binance, use your hundred dollars and never, ever, ever touch this there. I think the way to look at Zort coin is to think of it as you're investing in the company by buying the coin and staking it. And by staking it, you're getting rewarded by Daniel was explaining to me a little bit earlier, you get kind of extra perks in terms of the, the fees and things like that, basically. I haven't bought Zork coin myself at the moment, but um, I probably will. Um, but um, the, um, well, that's essentially it. So yeah, Zork power powers the trading that goes on on the AI and the coin, basically, um, just think of that as if you were investing in any of the coin, and the benefits you get from, from that basically and hopefully it'll go up in value but also it gives you benefits within the system it is confusing to start with because they all use the term or it's not like and and i think the ai trading side of it it takes a while to get used to it as well so i think yeah, i learned yeah. a lot a lot better when i'm actually doing it which is why i just wanted to put some money in start doing it and then i'll get familiar with the platform but yeah I just even struggled connecting it to my finance and so i kind of fell at the first hurdle which is so that, that's that, good because it's Go on, go on. I was going to say, I was going to say a side note on that is I, I know we we've no, we've previously like unadvocated Coinbase. Um, I haven't used my Coinbase account for about eighteen months, but I have used it for Zort, and all I've got is the funds that power Zort in because I can connect the API just by myself. And so, if if you've got a Coinbase account, it's worth doing that. So that's just a side note. Basically, you don't have to get you know contact the Zort admins to do it all and all those sort of things. So. I think Louisa as well didn't want to keep moving her funds. Is that right? Yeah, because um, I had them in Coinbase and then I sold them. And yeah, bought, I remember this coin. All in finance, and I don't want to kind of keep moving them back and forth all the time. Um, but, so, but when, I... sorry, when support have to do do this connection, well, they have to it for every kind of not every trade, but every time I want to connect more. Say, I just want to try with like. A small amount initially and then i want to connect more is it just the initial connection of the api that they have to do they don't have to do it each time do they correct what, what once an api is established it basically means this has got some level of um um control or whatever of this so in your instance it would be viewing balances and trading once that connection is made it's made some mm -hmm. sites will say every 12 months you have to re-authenticate the connection to prove you still want it like a security measure but in essence an api once it's done it's done if you want to add more into here allow Zort to trade more that's fine side note for anybody if you're looking to do something like what louise is doing i highly recommend separated accounts 
Now, Louise, if you request with Binance, you can create a sub account and another sub account. You could call one of your sub accounts, resort. You put a thousand USDC in it. And that way, any money it's made, you can cleanly and clearly see. If you start using your main portfolio account and you've got a bit of it trading on this platform and I don't know, you're staking something over there. It, when it comes to wealth management, there comes a point when you need better systems. It's like I could manage 10 clients right now without a, a, a diary, let's say. But you give me 100 clients and it's just not possible. You need, you know, same with you're in property, yeah? You can manage two properties probably without thinking, but as soon as you've got 10, 15, 20, you need a property manager. You need systems and things. You've got calls coming in, client tenants, and you know, we've all been tenants and probably had tenants. It's it's an interesting process. So um, managing crypto is pretty much the same. Um, and I know you might not want to move coins, but you're also learning a lot at this stage. And yeah. it is part of the um, just part and parcel of it. So I didn't really have a sub account, but I definitely will look into doing that. Resort. You have to now request it. So you'll have to open a ticket with um you have to open a ticket with Binance, which is a interesting ball process egg. to begin. Yeah, it is a ball egg. Um <laughs> what people don't realize is because there is no ask whatever question, it's gonna feed you some questions. Just click on one. And then say, no, this didn't answer my question. Are you sure? Yes. Do you want, a, what do you want to do? And it'll say exit. And then really small, it'll say, I'd like to chat to an operator. Once you click that, you're talking to somebody. But most people never even get that far. They get to the questions and go, well, they're not my, not my questions. You can speak to an operator, but you have to really want to. So what we got there, we got this API connection to MetaMask and what Louise has done in this instance, but it's confusing because she's never really used MetaMask's for APIs before. So in the early stages of crypto, you don't do. But then at some point, um, Ben, who comes on these calls, Ben was part of our Crypto Nights fund that we started. You know, he'd been in um, crypto for a good few years and had avoided MetaMask. And I remember when I avoided MetaMask as well, it was just a bit, oh, I don't need it. You, you do, you might not need MetaMask particularly, but contextually, the idea of a browser extension wallet, uh, Paul, you talked about Anchor. If you want to use Anchor, you have to use Terra Network's browser extension wallet. Not two ways about it, but it's exactly the same as MetaMask's extension wallet. It's just, you know, it sits in your browser, it authenticates websites, gives permission to allow some money to move from you either move or be locked from point A to point B. Um, Anchor for those listening is a, is a decentralized DeFi protocol for returns. It gives you 20% return on stable coin, which is a phenomenal return. Uh, and like we talked about in the call the other week, you can get insurance on that for like 0.075%. Um, I feel like saying this call was sponsored by Anchor. Um, oh. and, and it's really, really good, but it requires moving into browser extensions and APIs. Well, not really an API, but at least a browser extension. Rod. Um, is it fair to say that um, things like the browser extensions like Meta, uh, MetaMask, for example, which we've been talking about a lot, um, it sounds as if that's kind of in a way a bit like a firewall um, almost like um, an additional layer of security. Uh, am I right on that or is that completely wrong? Well, I would say a firewall sits between two parties. I'm here, you're there, we have a firewall or a VPN. These are they're different, but they sit between two parties. Um, MetaMask is the end party. So your money is in MetaMask. When Paul, Paul uses Anchor, his money is in Terra let's call it Terra Wallet, which is a browser extension. And when he goes on to Anchor and says deposit, this will pop up and say, something's trying to access me. You know, are you okay with that? And you go, yeah, I am. And then it'll say how much you want to deposit and you'll say a thousand dollars and it'll. So I wouldn't say it's a firewall because firewall is a layer of security and protection and sits between two parties. 
Um, yeah, I, I would say I would I would say it's a helpful friend sat on your shoulder. But you've got to look after a, it. The API um, analogy is quite good. If you understand what an API is, it's like the handshake, isn't it, between two things, and it's like the connectivity between the two things that are allowing to, to an action to happen. Basically, MetaMask is exactly the same. I think the only difference is that it kind of met. If you've got MetaMask open or TerraWallet or any of these things, if you go on the relevant website for it. Um, it will immediately recognize that it's on there and it will pop up and say, do you want to take an action? Yes, no. And, and it happens like that. So I think it's one of those things you have to use um, and get a little bit uncomfortable with because it is uncomfortable using it. Um, we, um, I think me and Daniel kind of went through uh, with another guy um, when we first started using it. We thought, well, we'll go through this together basically and figure out how it's going to do it. And I remember I lost that. Yeah, and it was horrible. <laughs> it was really horrible because we were all sitting there going, right, I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. Um, and then, uh, I mean, I lost I lost us a bunch of coins, you know, because I'd lost something or other. And you don't realise you're logging in and out in certain ways and if you don't put the right thing down, the passwords. So it's, um, once, but once you're over that, you kind of understand it, but it never, I, I second guess myself all the time. And sometimes if you just get a little bit blah, then you can just go around clicking buttons. It's the fastest way to lose a lot of money quite quickly. Um, both in kind of fees and all these different things if you're using Uniswap and all these different things. But it's it's um, it's a steep learning curve. But I think the point being is that we've talked about this before is if you're moving into the space where um, you know, you want to move away from traditional TradFi, you know, banking and all the rest of it. Um, you know, ultimately, if you want to get access DeFi, you're going to have to use this, these, these MetaMask and all these other things. So there's a learning curve, um, and it's not something you should try and do quickly or no, with any significant amount of money. It's kind of like baby steps first um, and, and be willing to make mis mistakes with it. But I think it's really important from the you know we've talked about the sovereign individual from a from a financial perspective it's like you got to look at the point of view we give all our trust to the banks to look after our money and all we need is and if we lose anything passwords or anything we just phone up and go go through a bunch of questions and they're going to give us our access back you know um if you lose your access you've lost your access basically if you lose some coins it's gone so those, that's the thing where you have to be, you know, uh, comfortable with. It's anything like anything on the blockchain. If you send something to the wrong wallet, and you haven't, you know, it, it's not impossible to get to get it back. Basically, so I think it's about, about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and moving into that space. Mm -hmm. Really, um, I mean, we talked. We, about we, 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 go on, Richard. I was going to say before. Yeah, we took. We there's a there's one of these calls before. We took a load of people through <clears throat> setting up MetaMask. Mask, it was a little bit. Mask, mask. It was very um, uh, sort of a chaotic, uh, chaotic kind of, chaotic. Kind of uh, call, wasn't it, Dan? But it was um, uh, it was good fun, and people sort of made their way through it. So, and there's it looks like there's going to be um, MetaMask will release a token, and sometimes I just airdrop them. And the reason we did that was on the um, on the chance that it might happen. It so all the people on the call had a MetaMask wallet. And if, as long as they've kept all the seed phrases and stuff and they do and MetaMask do an airdrop like Uniswap did, um, they might just drop about 5,000 tokens, for example, and then you'll have those tokens for free because you've accessed and used MetaMask or put some, I think we got everyone to put $100, $150 through it, didn't we, basically? Yeah, um, it's good to have. And I, and, I, and I think from the Uniswap airdrop, I think that yielded us in one of our projects about 24 grand, roughly. Yeah. Something mm. like that. So, like, don't. It's not. It's not stuff to be shy at. To be just, just aware of these things. There is nothing guaranteed. But it's MetaMask being MetaMask. The fact that it's a decentralized wallet. So they've got this huge database of everyone that's got a wallet and how long they've had a wallet and how much money's in those. Well, yeah, how much money's in them? Because you've got to remember that um, blockchains are open. I can look at anyone's address at any time. I don't know who owns it, but I can see it. It's highly likely that they'll do a public airdrop because of the noise it would create, the excitement. Like, it's just... Um, and that's what things like Uniswap did and all these other places. So I think that would make the most sense. What criteria they use, 
like how much you have to have in it, how long it has to be active, how many trades, um, we'll yet to see. Um, we wrote something down though earlier, like it's one of the things we we're thinking about with the program and it was thinking about sovereign finance and it's in order to gain your independence, you have to try to stand on your own feet. It just makes, because if you're not doing that, whatever it is, you, you can't say you're independent. Um, and so that means that if you're not stood on your own feet, the process to do so will probably mean some level of stepping out of your own comfort zone. And this is applicable to everything as a, as a really simple mantra. So um, the whole MetaMask thing is really, really big. And, and I would like to, if it's, Richard, is it okay if, uh, well, you've already shared that we lost some coins, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the group of us that went into this together to learn, we said, we'll learn MetaMask together. We understood. We kind of pulled our resources. We understood that that meant potential gains and learning experiences, as we call them. But I want to share the two biggest learning experiences super quick, um, because part of standing on your own two feet is falling over. And uh, we are not um, shying coming forward, and we're certainly not. Um, when I had a big hack in my company and lost thousands, um, I told everyone, even though I felt a bit stupid and silly, I was like, there's no point in us hiding about this. I want other people to learn from my, from my mistake. So I'm just going to share with you really quickly. Um, oh, this was a picture I found where APIs sit. This is you on the left-hand side working on the internet. And uh, this is the thing you're trying to do here, and it works through an API interface. So it kind of sits between two parties. Um, but MetaMask is here. If you see it in the browser, and if I click it, it opens up, and it's got, at the minute, not put one BNB in it. Um, side note, these things can work on multiple blockchains. If I click this one, it's going to give me my address in MetaMask that works on Ethereum. This is the Binance blockchain, and I'm not going to go into any more than that. So it's got 0.1 BNB inside of it the first time we lost a lot of money richard logged in and he said zero and we were like oh god words are coins and we're all worried what we didn't realize is you can have multiple accounts multiple addresses inside metamask so he was here and it said zero and we had no assets no transaction and we were we just thought it had gone and i can't even remember how we found out or anything but you can have multiple accounts, which is useful, but can be confusing if you didn't know that. Um, but where we actually lost coins was, uh, Richard was going through a huge move at the time and it was just early on in the days and we weren't as accustomed to recording information. And this is the real sovereignty piece is for every one of these accounts, you have a private key. And remember, if you own the private key, you own the address. The, because the public key is derived from the private key. So every single account has got a private key. Obviously, I've got to put my password in here, but that would then give me my private key. If I have that private key and I give it to Paul, if Paul opens up his MetaMask and clicks create account, sorry, import account, if he pastes my private key into his MetaMask, he now has he'll have an account here titled as whatever he's called it. And he has access to all of my funds in that account. Does that make sense to people? Yeah. Um, but when you launched MetaMask, it gave you a seed phrase and that seed phrase would give you access to all the accounts within it. The seed phrase, um, the seed phrase grows the tree. And off that tree is an infinite amount of private keys. But any one of those private keys I could give to someone and they would have access to think of a private key like fruit or branches. A fruit's probably a better analogy. And um, each one of those private keys I can give to different people and they'll only have access to that one address. But the seed phrase, think of it like a seed, the seed goes in the ground, that seed grows a whole tree with literally an infinitesimal number of addresses. So that's the two ways that we thought we'd lost money with MetaMask and did lose money with MetaMask. And um, this is the whole thing on sovereign finance, looking after those keys. 
So anybody thing, not? I, suppose, um, I, I, just, I, I just keep taking the side notes as well. The other way you can um, think that you've lost things and it pops up, it's popped up in the group a few times with uh, MetaMask is if you log out, for some reason, it doesn't always be with certain coins. You have to add the asset in to the token. So you go to go coin gecko or coin market cap you grab the contract code <clears throat> for the coin you want to buy you put that into metamask or uniswap or whatever and that will rec it recognizes them within the wallet that's the coin you want to import and then you might buy that coin and it sits there but then you might log out and then you might log back in again and for some reason that token will disappear in within that account and so you'll suddenly go ah oh, where's my money gone and I don't know why it does that, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, I've never been able to figure out, figure out why that is, but it is a known glitch and lots of people constantly panic that they've lost money within it. So. And your easy answer to that is if you take your address and you go to an Ethernet scanning site and put it in, it will list all of the tokens that you've got in that address because it's a blockchain, it can see it. But with MetaMask, it doesn't work the other way around. You have to... You have to say, hey, I've got this token, and then poof, it's there. They're always there, but in MetaMask, you might not see them. Mm. That's, a, that's, a, that's a lot on APIs and MetaMask. Uh, Louise, I'm just making sure then you're cool with how to do your Binance thing with Zort. But, yeah, definitely answer yeah, my question. Well. I'll look into that and hopefully sort out. And I wanted to use her question to just open up this whole MetaMask and API thing because it is a really big part around sovereign finance. Um. Awesome. So we're going to move on to uh, Paul's questions around BTC, uh, its future plan B and companies. Um, anybody not know what plan B is? Out of the context of plan A. Okay, Rod at least and Louise. Paul, you brought it up. What would you say plan B is? Oh, hang on, hang on. You're muted. Just unmute yourself. Hopefully you come back and hear me okay. Yes, yep, go for it. Um, so plan B is uh, a Dutch guy who uh, apparently has like an institutional investor background and he has produced this model. The original model was the stock to flow model and then he reduced and then he produced a second model based on this kind of the price appreciation of assets which have scarcity so gold and diamonds and real estate and all the rest of it and he creates this really interesting projection so he's on he's on twitter and he has some really interesting engagement um and his model um it kind of extrapolates a price above 200k around december of this year and a minimum price i think or an average price at the end of the year of 100 100k and, um, you know, lots of people, lots of commentators um, speak very po positively about it and are interested to see it unfold. He himself even says the model works until it's broken and then it doesn't work. And that, I suppose the only in other interesting voice in that is the guy, Michael Saylor, who owns Michael, Michael Strategy. You know, he says, well, all the models are now broken. You know, the halvings don't matter. Like, we're, you know, everything is going upwards. So there's obviously two camps, but I was interested I think particularly, like, do you, do you think, like, just as a, an overall principle, do you think the model has legs? And then specifically, you know, what impact that might have on, like, the amazing performance we saw last time round in the public miners, like, they went 20, 30x, which was extraordinary. Like, do we think we'll see that again? Cool, really valid questions and a good summary of plan B. Um, yeah. I want to reiterate one line that you said, though. It works until it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I was viewing something the other day that basically um, you guys will have seen uh, plan B stock to flow. If you watch any crypto videos at some point, you'll have seen these images. Uh, share screen. There you go. So these are Plan B's famous stock to flow images. They're probably going to be a little bit outdated. I'm just going to pull this one up. Um, open image in new window. Here we go. So um, you can see how, so the white line is the model 
the colored line is the um, the price. And there's there's various points where the the line, the colored, the reality of the price is quite a long way from the line. Um, but it's it, it's never really gone too far under, and it's always corrected. So when when's this from 2021? So we're basically a whole year in. Um, and this is the stock to flow model two S two. Oh no, it's not. That's just the he made a second flow. Yeah, he made yeah. a second model. So the reason I'm going to reiterate what Paul said, um, which is it's it's correct until it's broken. I think the last time I saw there's a window right now where either it gets back to the model or his first model is broken. Um, and that is like how long it's taken to refine the model again. Um, so I'm just sharing that so you guys can relate. You, you will have seen this probably in some videos. Um, and he, he made a second model. Go on. So I think on the current model, um, and I've not been, I've been a little bit out of the loop for a bit, but I believe 47K was his target whenever, when it, when it bombed, you know, when Bitcoin crashed a few months ago, <clears throat> and everyone's going, oh, you know, it's the end or whatever. He was still saying, well, you know, if it hits 47K by the end of August, that's, that's the model. Um, and, you know, a month ago, it didn't look like we were going to get there, but, but it has. Um, and I believe, correct me if I'm like right, Paul, <clears throat> you've obviously looked into this in a fairly deep way. Um, but I think he only, it's only, he only invented it a year, eight, about two years ago, I think it was something like that, 2018 maybe. <clears throat> and, but when he, when he modeled it backwards, that's when it, it obviously, you know, it's, it's followed it. And there's a range, some of them show a range. Uh, there's like a blue um, band that goes through it and it will range in between those two things. As long as it stays, if it's blue or green, and if it stays in between there, which it always, I believe, has, it's rarely gone outside that range, then it's still within the model. And so, um, and as you say, <clears throat> the stock to flow X, then extrapolate. I think there's a logarithmic model, which is more blocky. Um, and then there's the, um, and there's reasons that I don't fully understand for, for looking at a logarithmic versus an algorithmic model as well, basically. But yeah, fascinating. And the stock to flow X then pulls in the different um, asset classes to then uh, model against, basically. So um, it will hit, say, some people are saying it's going to hit the, the global, the market cap of gold. And that's where it where it will hit there, you know, and you can kind of track it. Um, and you like to think, I think, um, to, in, to, in some respects, that um, things are kind of, well, the markets are, uh, are um, we, don't know what we don't know what they're defined by. It's not that one. No, that's the cross-asset model. But there's a different, I, I saw him talking about this other one today. I think that's potentially the adoption curve one. Because um, I found that this is the live, um, this is the live stock to floor. I was trying to find mm -hmm. that other one. But go on, sorry, I didn't mean to break you. That's cool. I think if you go on his Twitter, what often he shares, the, that's quite a good place to actually go because he'll show to sort of the band that I'm talking about and different things and he explains how he's, how he's using it. Um, mm. So, you know, but, but I think um, it's not technical analysis. And I think he talks about this a lot where it's not around technical analysis. It's just a set and set, set of parameters um, around demand and adoption and in, in investment cycles for, for other, you know, the people that, you know, for an asset class, basically. And, um, but it's amazing. It's amazing. Just you can't, and, and like he says, it, it, if it once it's broken, it's broken, but it's never, so far, it's never broken. It's just followed it. So it's, it's a, it's a fascinating. Uh, uh, fascinating and this model. is in the same park as um, the Simon Dixon we were talking about earlier. He once said, you know, everyone talks about the demise of the US dollar and fiat's going to zero and the US dollar is going to lose its global reserve, all these things. And he went, but it's not today. Mm -hmm. We can speculate all we want and everything. He said, but until the US dollar is not the leading global reserve fiat, irrelevant of your view of fiat, today the US dollar is the, the most powerful um, uh, fiat currency. And so he, the argument was like keeping some in there and earning with it in different different wealth and income strategies and people were like well, why would you keep it in the us dollar it's going to crash him but it hasn't so you can hedge against things so at the minute the model's working and um and like plan b says it'll work until it doesn't work i my personal view um 
I'm really conservative when it comes to shiny, exciting numbers. If Bitcoin goes to 250K this year, that's a bit, that's, that's, that's a lot. Now, like Paul was inferring going back in times when we're looking at 20, 30 X's, is it possible? Absolutely. Does all the maths add up? Does all the, we've got institutional buying power. We've got, you know, it, all the ducks really are in that proverbial line. Um, but I'm comfortable seeing a hundred K Bitcoin. You know, my brain can accept that. And, and, and I, it's not that I'm trying to be negative or, or anything like, but if I had to bet just because it's crypto, there's manipulation, there's whales, there's whenever, ev and there's an old saying in, in investing, when everybody thinks it's going left, look right. Mm -hmm. And me and Richard have talked about this all the time. We're like, it's too easy. It's too obvious. What are we missing? What are we missing? And every couple of weeks, we have a, one of these crypto meetups physically here in Mexico. And, you know, there's Bitcoin maximalists and Ethereum maximalists and hidden in the dark corners, there's XRP maximalists. Um, and um, they all have different views. So I, I don't know. I wouldn't bet and put all my money in eggs in one basket that Bitcoin's going to hit 250 and try and get hold of a lot more Bitcoin to, to go for that. Do I think it could touch six figures? I do think it could reasonably touch six figures. And I wouldn't be surprised if more. Um, I think everything's there to say it until plan B is not there. That's my view. Richard, do you think differently or do you, are you on that same page? I'm trying to keep oh, it just shorter. Looking um, view of Bitcoin price, you mean? Yeah. In um, general, like, you know, are you a 250 K or have we already peaked? Are you somewhere in between? I have no idea. I think, I think um, some people are saying, uh, you know, 60, 70 K will be the top. Um, <clears throat> the stock, you know, I think if we manage to keep keep through this next month, I think September is going to be quite key. I think it's a very key um, for lots of different reasons, um, not regulation being one of them. Um, mm. The uh, you know we could quite quite reasonably see um, uh, the mania hit and and the prices go up. So I think potentially hundred uh, k before you know around Christmas time, New Year. Um, but we could go out. I think what happens September in this month, next this coming month, September, is going to be the, def the the defining moment for it, basically. So, I, I'm in a lot of altcoin channels with really serious technical people that are way over my head, and in the last 48 hours, they've all gone bonkers about the coming alt season this month. Parallelically, it's a new word. Uh, in parallel to that. Um, is we're entering a Bitcoin dominance and a Bitcoin season. Now, you can't have a Bitcoin season and an altcoin season. But what if September is an altcoin run that will then inevitably mean all that money switches back to Bitcoin, which when we look at the five stages of crypto is the bottom bit before winter, which is the final bit when altcoins have a run, or in this case, it will be a second run of the season. Although we had a big drop, would it still be considered a run? I don't know. But the end of that is back into Bitcoin. Um, so uh, I'm definitely hopeful and fruitful. I don't think we're entering a winter. I do think we're going to have a, a, a good run. Um, but I'm just usually conservative because you're already getting comfortably 100% returns a year in crypto, quite comfortably. So I, I, I'm, I don't need to see, as Lark says, face-melting gains. Um, would I like a face-melting gain? Oh, of course. Um, but I try not to talk about them because it gets, you know... <laughs> Sucking on that hopium, as, uh, as Locke would say. And I try and keep it a bit uh, calm, especially in FLT, because we're, we're trying to encourage safety and rising in that manner. So that mm -hmm. is our views, Paul, on Plan B. Is that good enough? Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Really helpful. Thank you. Cool. As for public listed companies, what does it mean if Bitcoin hits 150K, I'm picking a figure, 200K, and you're a publicly listed company, mining bitcoin um, and you referred to some uh, companies that do that a couple i've never heard of before to be fair when you say here you said um ryan marathon margot yeah riot r-i-o-t riot cool um 
I mean, in short, if you're holding that bit, that bit, Bitcoin will be sat on their balance sheet. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the only way is up. I can't, I can't, how much and how far. I think we're going to see more and more companies operating in public listed exchanges. Sorry, being on exchanges as public listed companies. Whether it's Michael Saylor's like and, and Tesla holding it on the balance sheet, whether they're mining it, whether they offer EFTs and different um, ways to get exposure to crypto. I am massively bullish on any company that is in the crypto space, but is a fiat, a fiat finance company. Because yeah. I think there's a, I think, you know, we're still at less than 1% of the world with a, a wallet. Mm -hmm. Just never forget that. We're, we're so early, we can't see what's being built. We think we're, we're on the ship, but we're on the dinghy. And next to us being built is a cruise ship. And if you've ever seen a, cru a cruise ship, just imagine being on a dinghy, like you're just dwarfed or a cargo ship. So we're so early, like we're in 1996, 1997 internet territory. And imagine being here now and going back to 96 and saying that, you know, in what, 15, 17 years, you'll all just be sat on a call talking to each other with no lag and no one's paying for it. So um, all the money is in fear. All the money is in fear, exponentially in fear. So if you're a company operating in the crypto space and then crypto goes bonkers in a bull run, I, that's going to go insane. However, the inverse winter will, will have some effect. Um, so that'd be my two pence. I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. is in stocks or wants to put an alternative on that. Is that what you're trying to do, Paul? Is, um, it, is it around in, investing in, in uh, some of these companies or is that, is that your interest in it? Yeah, so I so I invested in them last year and they did unbelievably well. And obviously they've pulled back now, but I took like profits on the way up and that was really good. And it was just interesting to see the the outperformance to the underlying asset. And and I suppose circling back to Rob Rod's point, you know, you can hold these companies in tax wrappers. So you can hold them in your ISA, and that's you know completely tax free forever. You can even hold them in your SIP if you have a, a SIP and that's deferred taxation. You know, uh, yeah. So I was just interested in your views. I mean, fingers crossed. We'll see. We'll see some um, performance yeah. again. Yeah. I, it, I think you, it, the, the main thing to I always go back to is when you when you sort of compound the growth of Bitcoin since inception, it's 200% a year. That's the return. So you know anyone that's buying this mining bitcoin and particularly i think now that the hash rate has moved west yeah so it's not china can't really well they can't they can't create the, the fud and the fear and the crashes that they have done before to do with bitcoin specifically and bitcoin mining um can they do it around you know the the, the fear around regulation and anything else around central bank digital currencies Yes, they can influence that way, and that's what that's probably their next move. Um, but I think, you know, as Daniel said, if 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 these companies are now American companies and they're then they're fiat based, um, and Bitcoin goes up two hundred percent a year over time, then that's the maths, right? It doesn't. <laughs> it's it's relatively simple from that perspective, I guess. So, uh, as Daniel says, I think you know if you pick the right runners. Um, uh, any blockchain company, mining company at the moment, then you can't really lose, you know. We're also talking about slightly directed. different things here um, because when we refer to 200% a year, we're referring to an investor, a hodler. Mm -hmm. and, and, and time over time, hodling in Bitcoin, hodling in crypto beats an investor. Doing mm -hmm. nothing will yield more, but you doing nothing is boring and requires either ignorance to not look at the market or hands of diamonds if you are looking. What Paul's talking about there more when, you know, like taking profits is, is, is strategic players in things. You have way more awareness of what's going on to, to make that decision. And I think one of the reasons that they outperformed maybe Bitcoin in, in that cycle in that year is because so much money doesn't want to be in crypto. 
and or, or legally can't pension funds sips you know they can't buy bitcoins that's why grayscale trust can sell its shares but pro rata if you buy a share in grayscale trust at some points you were paying well at the early stages literally like 200 percent more than the value of the coin but these people knew that long term that would play out for them because they're dealing with billions of dollars that can't buy crypto so the closest thing they can do is a fund that has exposure to crypto so i think that there's just vastly so much more money and all they're interested in is the ride they're just interested in how much is the share price now bitcoin does its thing over here share price goes up i'll capitalize on that 15 percent well in, in stocks it, i don't know what it was for those stocks but I'll, I'll capitalize on that growth take my money and maybe go whereas i think the mentality in cryptos traditional crypto is different especially with so many purists and, and whether you're a purist who just does bitcoin or whether you're a retail investor who has very little experience in investing what you know is to hold whereas when you're coming from more of a wealth management side you're literally wearing different caps you're viewing things differently and you're you've got more awareness of different ways you might earn so i think that there's at any one time, you could look at something in the fiat world and say, well, that outperformed holding Bitcoin. So why would I put 50 grand in Bitcoin when I could put 50 grand here? Perfectly valid question. But not everyone would ask that question because it requires the ability to mentally and knowledgeably to actually take that profit and to make that decision. Whereas here, people can know, well, if I just buy the Bitcoin and hold it for three years, statistically speaking, based on 10 years of history, I should get 200% a year compounded and I'll take that. So I think that they're different methodologies, just like Zort. Louise has just gone into Zort, which is going to trade her money. And the constant conversation in the group the other week, someone's like, well, if I just held Bitcoin, I'd have made more money. You would have done, but that's a whole, a whole different strategy. But then if you held it and it dropped 50%, you'd have to wait ages for it to come back up again. Whereas in the trading strategy, you're buying, selling, buying, selling, you know, you're building your coffers up bit by bit. So I think that's one of the other factors at play when we're looking at fiat. And a large, a large part of the money that, that buys these mining companies is not retail investors. You know, what drives the stock market is the same thing that drives the crypto market, whales, large scale investors. And if you think the stock market can be manipulated, at how big is the stock market? How many trillion is the stock market? 30 trillion? Whatever it is. Crypto's two course it's manipulated and who bears the brunt of it we do I, you know i accept that fully um so i think that's always got to be factored in that as a as a retail investor you're playing with if you're looking at investing you are up against those big dogs as well uh, which is one of the reasons why we just don't promote uh, in general trading go on rod you, yeah um uh, re yeah, really, really interesting, guys. And just coming back to something Paul said, which um, uh, just just to clarify, and I, I think I'm fairly sure of this, but um, what Paul was saying was that you could use tax exempt wrappers like like SIP, uh, but that's only for a fiat company that holds crypto, not crypto itself. Is that right? So you can't directly put crypto, your crypto holding into a SIP. No. No. Do you think that? Do you I think was waiting for will... Paul. To... Yeah. So, do you so... think that will come? So you used to be able to put in a derivative. Um, so there's a, a a euro denominated exchange traded note which you used to be able to get off uh, in your ISA or your SIP. But the when the FCA banned derivatives in the UK, all of the platforms um, prevent you buying anymore. So they're still around. But I mean, you don't know how. You take the risk on the asset, but then you take the risk on the product as well. And so you're kind of doubling your risk. Um, but so I don't know of a way of owning them directly through those wrappers anymore. But what you can do is you can own the miners, like um, the, the tickers like Mara, Riot, Argo, Hive. Uh, they're the only ones that I, I've got access to on the platforms that I use. Uh, and then you can like, obviously, Coinbase um, and then uh, MicroStrategy is kind of like a B BTC ETF now, isn't it? You know, until it gets told off. Um, so that that's the approach that I've I've seen, not direct ownership through those vehicles. But I I know that Simon Dixon, I know that I, I've seen from afar that he 
has a whole tax strategy. I don't know the details of it. I mean, you pre presumably you do around kind of ring fencing your crypto gains. Yeah, so th this really comes down to, and I will say this, Rod, if you message um, Michael Gowlett, I'm just going to put, what's his handle? Here we go. G at Rod. What's your, what's your name in the group? Mine? Yeah. Um, well, email address. No, no, no. The at symbol in the future leaders group. Uh, it's, it's this one, I think. It's mine. It's the name I've got on screen, Rod Hart, isn't it? No, if I go yeah. at Rod, you're not there. Oh. Okay, it's okay. Uh, Rod, um, message this guy in here to ask about uh, index funds. Yeah. Okay. So um, he, um, uh, Michael, who's the guy who just messaged, is interested in using sites like, Ed. these are British ones for anyone that's international, but I'm pretty certain everyone here is British anyway at the minute, um, using things like AJ Bell and... Hard, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, these sorts of sites that have like self-managed SIPs and different forms of investments. So he's found quite a few um, crypto index funds. Now, I can only guess that these are a mixture of companies and mining companies. I'm not aware of a British, um, you know, company fund that's predominantly Bitcoin or Ethereum. So you're kind of getting that exposure. Uh, but that's the best you can do. If you're going to go down traditional finance, TradFi, it, and you're going to use the word tax efficient, that's, that's your bag. Your only other thing from then on in, and this is, this is a smaller, simpler version of Simon Dixon's, uh, when he says plan B, he means retirement plan B, as in uh, B for Bitcoin and, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, plan B because it's alternative to plan A. Plan A is a traditional finance, plan B is... Bitcoin. And it, you're basically using companies as tax structures, which to be fair, perfectly segues us into crypto tax anyway. Um, the general global view of tax is if you own it, you're going to pay the most tax in general. Now you can have an ISA and a SIP, and these are personal tax vehicles um, or wrappers to do things in. But then because it's, it's a legal thing someone's made, a SIP, an ISA, you are bound by an obscene amount of legality. So an ISA can't buy a house. A SIP can, but it can only buy a commercial property. It can't buy a rental, pro uh, a domestic property, things like that. Um, and you can't cash it out. And if you do cash it out, you pay a fee on it until a certain age. If it's a SIP, if it's an ISA, you're limited with how much can go in every year. Nothing wrong with them. And they're great. As soon as you choose a company as your structure, um, on the one side, the pros, it opens up anything. A company can have an account with Binance, Coinbase, can trade on Zort, can buy Bitcoin. A company is a legal entity. You are a legal entity if we get to like that um, legal definitions as a human being. So, and you can do where a company can do anything a human can do in the financial world. The downside is you then enter a new level of complexity. Most people don't own a company. Most people have never even filed a personal tax return. So you suddenly go to, I want to be legally as tax efficient as possible. You're moving into a higher level of complexity of knowledge of, of doing that. Do I have a limited company? Do I have an LLC? Do I have an S corp in America. What does it mean to file accounts as a as a company with a foreign as an entity with a foreign company? All of these things. Um, what I usually say to my clients when we discuss these sorts of things, and I am not a tax advisor at all, or a financial advisor. I just have a lot of experience in both of these fields and have spun enough plates to have quite a big, broad conversation to steer you in the right direction. But the first question is, how big's the problem? If you're sat on a hundred k crypto. You think it's going to be worth a million. That is a 900K um, growth. That is a big tax problem, potentially. Because if it's in your name, you can never really get it out of your name without paying a, a hefty tax bill. So that's worth investing in 
options to be really efficient with that long term to, to protect it from from death to be able to hand it down to your family without paying large sums these sorts of things um and and it could be worth spending 50 grand on a solution because it's worth hundreds to you if you're sat on a one grand crypto portfolio think it's going to go to 10 grand i mean you're allowed 12 and a half grand capital gains every single year as a uk citizen so you know it's not a problem could it be a problem in five ten years time maybe um and it's really good what does it say like a poor mindset thinks about last year's tax today a rich mindset think of, thinks about five years tax ahead today so it's good to find out what, what's the size of the problem that i'm experiencing and um then you can kind of see how much you'd be willing to spend on it because once you start moving into company creation territory and it doesn't need to be complex but it still requires you to do things you might never have done before um transferring of assets into a company structure which is rpb uh, simon dixon that we we're talking about and he has a very complex structure that's completely legal which is all to do with shares and buying shares but again if you're going to move into things like this i, I would highly encourage you to know what you're doing uh, not to know what you're doing to know what's being done it's one thing to pay someone to set up something that ticks all the boxes and hmrc is okay with it and all these things but it's another thing to be able to articulate what it is um otherwise you, going back to sovereign finance you don't really know what you've done and um it's one of the reasons why i don't like it when I, someone says to someone oh why did you buy that or daniel said to buy it you know it's like or bob did or or this or that it's like there's no um, someone can give you a piece of information, but the whole point of sovereignty is to process that, feel into it. And if you say, I took a punt on it because someone gave me the information and I trusted them enough to go, do you know what? Fuck it. Nothing wrong with that. That's sovereign ownership of an educated punt based on some trust of some person. But because you've consciously thought about why you're doing it. Um, so that's the simplest, quickest, easiest answer on the whole tax question, because it is a you know, it's a month's worth of calls, and that's just for English citizens. Um, alternatively, side note, you can leave England. If you leave England, you walk away with all of our assets tax-free. Full stop. Where you go, different question. Um, but there is a period where um, you could be in any country and not pay any tax. Now, I'm not an international tax advisor or a lawyer, it is a huge gray area for the world. There's more and more digital nomads traveling in the world. How do you, who do you pay tax to if you're not tax liable in your home country and you haven't lived in a country long enough to earn tax, to pay tax? Um, and I think that will be answered more and more. Costa Rica last week just said you can enter their country for two years on a two year visa and not pay any tax, which means you can legally go to Costa Rica for two years earn as much money as you want and you pay no income tax. And as a British citizen, you wouldn't pay income tax because you've left England and English law states, you could only pay tax if you're a resident. And if you leave the country for 12 months or more, um, you're automatically a non-resident. So tax is a really big one, but I would say if the answer is around company structures, if you're not going to use things like ICEs and SIPs and stuff like that. Does that answer okay. your question enough, Rod? Um, it, it's certainly given me some things to think about, certainly around um, 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 using a, a company to potentially do, do uh, whatever trading and make whatever potential capital gains um, and, and then wrap the company in something that can be tax exempt. So there's some, yeah. some stuff to think about there, but I mean, don't don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I'm actually th this question is more pertinent to um, m my partner's son, who's currently thinking of leaving the country um, because of his um, the tax situation. Um, so that was my main reason for asking. But it's also I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, but don't get me wrong, because I I, I believe that um, you know taxes should be paid where taxes are due. What I think is that 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 a lot of taxation to my mind now and i'm going off on a rant here is not being used appropriately 
And, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and if we had something <laughs> like like Iceland, Iceland are operating, which is a citizens' assembly where the people actually elect how they pay their taxes. They have chosen to pay more tax because they say where it's going to go and what yeah. services it's going to be used for. But in the UK, all, all, all we see is tax being used to to um, to basically pay the. Oh no, I'm not going to go there. Sorry, I'm going yeah, to leave it there. Leave it there. there. I, I have a general saying: like I am pro tax. Uh, cities, okay. hospitals, roads, everything we take for granted got built because of taxes. But I am not pro war. Uh, end of story. I, I, in any shape or form, I'm so against war. I, it can't. I can't, I can't believe it. So like when you start to look just on that principle, how much is used, I'm like, I'm not. I'm not for that. Me and Christina would choose to contribute a lot of money towards well, our focus is trees and children. So we're, we're trying to find them wherever we live. So in Mexico at the minute, we're just work beginning to speak to a school um, to spend that money towards helping those children, particularly around meditation. So we're thinking about future. What can we spend today that really in the next 50 years will have made a difference? And it doesn't take too much thought before you get to kids like well i'm not going to save the world you're not going to save the world maybe our kids that we have or the kids today might be in positions in 50 years to make better decisions than our current ceos and if we can influence that great and if we can make things cleaner great um and so we kind of take that view into our own hands whilst moving around the world and changing our tax situation and all of these things so i'm i'm um I'm not anti-tax, but like you said, it's important. All right, well, where's where's the money going? And Iceland is one example of how that, but we all choose every single day, every pound, every dollar we spend, cast a vote. Every pound or dollar we don't spend, cast a vote. So be really conscious of where these votes are that we're casting. And earlier on, when we talked about the in, like reflections of, was this this call or a different call? I don't know, but I said everything's a mirror. I said that today anyway. And, um, and so... I truly believe as part of wealth creation is, is and wealth management and sovereign finance is giving back. And there comes a time when you have enough money, even in lower levels of finance to go, right, it's a tool. What am I going to do with it? And um, that's why for a couple of years I've done, I, I'm just giving. I work generally on donation basis now and just to see what happens with, with how that influences um, uh, how I go about doing things. So that is um, that tax companies explore leaving the UK. There are some caveats to it. Just get some advice on it. Um, and if you wanted to chat away from this, I'm quite happy to um, to share what I've learned from it. Um, and I'm sure Richard would as well. Yeah, I, I just 14, would, like, 20, would like, go on. Just like to, to, to quickly say one thing, Daniel, on, on that. Um, uh, finding tax advice is actually incredibly difficult now. The number of tax advisors that, that uh, my partner's son has contacted and who have just simply not returned their calls and not got back to him. Uh, and, you know, and it seems like the question in the UK, certainly, the question he's asking that's anything to do with crypto is too hard and they don't understand it. And finding an independent, reliable tax advisor who can advise on this, it's really not possible at the moment in the UK. So I su I've suggested to him that he goes to um, a forum like this and he's now in dialogue with so, some guys online. Okay, okay, cool, cool. And bring him on here. We'll have a whole call on it because I mean, I'm not joking. This has been me and Richard's uh, hours. At, I don't even want to talk about it, like in terms of answering this question since last year and our, our summary answer after a lot of calls with a lot of people is first of all crypto is tre like property in the uk trying to find a crypto accountant uh, this was alan's question last week they don't exist but they don't need to exist it's the same as property that's how the uk treats it so as long as you've got your records in order just find a good accountant any good accountant will um can deal with it they just um more start going out there i have the contact for one accountant who's more than a big accountant who's more than comfortable to deal with it you won't find many small fry that have um managed it and it depends what it is you want doing this same accountant's company will also deal with leaving the uk formally because you do have to 
it's better to tell HMRC through formal procedures um, that you've left and you're not a tax resident at all. You don't pay any tax. Uh, and it's live from the date you got, you arrived at the airport. It's not from the date you filed. Um, but in terms of finding tax advice, if you're trying to find tax advice about crypto, it is difficult because they're in the financial industry and it's a very slow industry, but it's property. Like there's nothing, there's nothing special about it. Your gains are treated the same. Your assets are treated the same. It's the same. Um, and if I have another guy who is an international tax advisor for digital nomads, specifically digital nomads, people that move a lot, um, he, but he's not cheap. You're looking at $400 an hour, minimum two hours. Um, but I will tell you now he is worth every penny. And he really knows his stuff, but he's not specific, specific. He doesn't know the full ins and outs of the five year. Um, if you leave the UK, there's a five year period where if you come back for too long, they'll tax you. And it depends on dependencies that you've got, which is work, house, things like that. But the UK company know that fully. So a mixture between the two works, but that might cost you two grand. If you're only walking away with a 10 grand crypto thing, then it's you might not allocate that money to it. Um, it so to your um, original question is like, and, and linking up to the fact, you know, say, say for example, the Simon Dixon example is if you know what, what, what Bitcoin has done over time. So if you know, if you've got X amount investing whole calculator that we all got right through one of the and it kind of predicts so you can see where you're going to be in x amount of time and his thing is well in five or ten years time that's you know you need to be planning about where you want to live that's actually what he's saying around it, it as part of the part of the plan if your part's big enough because you can plot because we know the history of bitcoin you can make some assumptions about it risk reward all the rest of it you kind of know where you're going with it um then you can make those plans basically um but uh I mean, he had a tax advisor, his accountant, uh, a, a lawyer, um, and he's, he's got his whole team basically trying to create this structure. And they still, they got to the point where they registered the owners of the course and they still go, oh, we've got to go back to drawing board because it's not going to work. So it's so specific. And I think it's changing so much as well that if you go to, if you try and find someone, give me some tax advice around crypto, they go, oh, geez, well, first he's talking about crypto <laughs> and then all the other stuff that's going on around it, around the world, um, you know, it, it is a minefield. And so it, you, you can't, it, it, you have to be quite nimble with it, I think is the short, the short answer. But knowing where you're going to go or what, what your exposure is going to be over a period of time is, is, is where the plans come in. So, If, you're, if your son's looking to leave the UK, um, he's actually one of the easiest things to sort compared to staying in the UK and wrapping it. Because if you stay in the UK, and you've got assets in your name. Even if you made a company, the transferring of those assets would be a taxable event, which means they'd be sold at fair market value. If they bought them at 10, they're worth hundred. If you sell them, you just made 90 grand profit. Let's assume he's already a 40% tax rate payer. That's a big tax bill. And so there's a, we've never found a solution to safely move them. As Simon would say, you can't change the past. If you owe tax on that transference, you pay it. But what you're doing is you're protecting for the future. Um, but then leaving the UK is a different question. Where he goes and what he does is another different question. So it's, it, it might just be a case of separating it. To try and get a red magic pill for security and privacy doesn't exist. And I think trying to get a red magic pill for crypto long-term tax planningness doesn't exist because nobody has a clue and that includes governments and governments rule and then eventually solicitors and accountants catch up to that rule so i think you're just we're in this no space at the minute do the best you can um but i hope you get so i hope you get some help i hope you um, find some answers on it uh, we are coming up to the half hour um but I wanted to, I said, I've covered a little bit on, um, I want to make sure I just cover Paul's things. If I get, keep people for an extra minute or two, if you need to go, just go. Um, anchor, I'm all, I'm pro anchor. I think it's good um, with insurance because it is a smart contract. So I wouldn't do it without insurance. However, 
as soon as Zor earned me more money than Anchor, I moved all my money out of Anchor into Zor. I was like, why would I have 20% a year on a liquid asset when I can get 10% a month? It's just, it's a literally, and I spent ages thinking about it. And Coinbase include $150,000 insurance. Uh, and as much as I don't like Coinbase, it, it's probably from a trust perspective to look after my money. It's probably up there at the top. Anchor is spelled exactly as Paul's, uh, as you spelled it, Alan, in the chat, A-N-C-O-R. It is a DeFi protocol that's built on the Terra network, T-E-R-R-A, that owns UST, which is a stable coin. And I'm going to leave it there. It's a die stable coin, but it's a stable coin. So it doesn't change in price. And it's just a way to earn 20%. And you're basically locking it up to build their ecosystem. And it's very good. Um, but once I earned 20% in two months on sort, I was like, well, I'll just move it across. And I moved it bit by bit until the point I was like, you know what? I trust sort more. I know where it is. I can get it out easier. And it's earning me more money. But I am pro out anchor. Um, your second point referenced compass mining through YouTube influences. I am going to assume this is a bit like, and you can write these down guys, yield nodes. In fact, Paul, could you explain in like one minute what you think compass mining is? Um, I don't fully understand it basically. So I've seen like a couple of interesting podcasts on it on YouTube where um, you can basically um, buy in the future various mining units which they host and look after and it's totally serviced so the what what the, the what bitcoin podcast guy he's just been talking about it on twitter and so you like in for like fifty thousand us dollars but the theory at least is that you earn that back in the first year and then you get let's say three or four years um profitable mining after that you can choose like which mining company to go and to use as a kind of, it's kind of like a broker isn't it basically so they send you that sell you the miner you can decide where to send it to um and then go from there i've not but other than that sort of very top line i don't i haven't followed it i've seen a few people so, talking about it before so yeah. you're saying that so so you actually you are buying a rig so you yeah. own a rig for a slight, I mean, for a slightly increased price, I imagine, but then they manage the, um, where do you want it to be in mind? Uh, and then there'll be some deal where electricity costs are covered and then you get paid out um, the Bitcoin. So yeah, it's a hands-off, yeah. like owning a rental property, but you don't really, you don't manage it. You don't look after it. It's not even in your country. You just bought the house. And at some point you earn yield on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd go further and say it's like when you have uh, solar power and you put the solar panels on your roof and you sell it back to the grid sort of thing. Or it's kind of like that. You know, so you've got access yeah, okay. to it, but I think they're, they're paying for the whole thing, aren't they, basically? So they're paying cool. for it because Bitcoin miners are expensive to run. So. so stuff like this would fall for me into um, any form of passive income strategy. And, and I'm looking at risk. I'm looking at, how much is it going to cost me to enter? So I, I'm, I'm going to assume 50K is like entry point. You can't buy half a rig or can you? No, I think that's the package they're doing. That's the entry point. Yeah, cool. So it's 50K in. Uh, Lock-in period, I, I mean, sounds like a couple of years. I'm looking at minimum one year to get my return on capital. Um, okay, what's my downside? If Bitcoin crashed to 30K, I'm going to guess I'm getting paid out in Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're basically weighing up, what do I trust more? Do I trust the long-term growth of Bitcoin? Uh, and, I'm, and this sounds like it's a, th like min I, you'd, I'd probably be thinking about this as a three to four year minimum investment project. Um, and then I'm looking at risk, I'm looking at reward, I'm looking at returns. And then maybe like how decentralized am I or how, um, how linked am I to the crypto world, as an example? Um, if Compass is a legitimate company, go on, Rob, uh, Richard. 
Yeah, they are. They seem very legit. I think the other thing is, um, but it, I don't know if it tells. It's going to give you. How's it going to give you fifty grand return in a year? Is it how much you know? Bitcoin is it mining in your part of it? Basically, is the key thing. And I think the other thing, maybe they do it in a three year. Is it three year contract or four year contract? I don't know, but um, I know the miners go obsolete pretty quick, don't they? So um, yeah. you need to be upgrading it pretty quick as well. So. Yeah, that, so, yeah, that 50K, it, and it depends if it's going in a... And I'm going to bring us back to like one of Richard's big famous questions, which is why are you doing what you're doing? You know, if, if Paul, if you were someone that came to you and went, I've only got 50 grand, do you think I should put it in compass mining? You know, that's... No. Um, but if you're like, hey, I've sat on, a, a, on 500K this year and I want to start to diversify out of traditional owning of coins and i'm looking at things that are stable going to give me a bit of return and i've and i'm already doing this this and this and i'm looking at compass mining that could easily be a yeah um mm. for me if someone said i've got 50 grand if i took 50k would i put it into compass mining no i just I, i've seen far better and faster returns elsewhere that even if after a year or two they collapsed i'd have earned more money and so mm. But then that would be the question um, about that's the question all about return. You might also want this compass mining because you really want to keep Bitcoin going and you're interested to be part of the growth of Bitcoin. That's a different value structure. So mm. do does it look good and sound good and everything? Yeah, I definitely want to understand you get your money back in the first year. How? Is that assuming Bitcoin's price stabilized here? Um or is it fixed? You will get your money back. Um, and see you later, Rod. Thank you very much, man. Um, so that would be my, my first question. Would I do it personally? Probably not. I would. I'd split it amongst three or four of the strategies we talked about in the other call. Um, I'd rather be more fluid, especially in crypto. I don't want anything that requires two years for me to be up. That's a, that's a long time in crypto and Bitcoin, especially 50% of me loves it and thinks it's going to be the future and everything. 50% of me is waiting for a, that black swan piece of information that makes everyone go, oh shit, it's not Bitcoin. I'm just, yeah. I hear so much stuff. I, ha I have to be hedged against all coins disappearing and one of the top eight being the only one that exists. So does that kind of give you, uh, certainly my view, I don't know, Ricky, do you want to put any more yeah. pieces in? That's really, I'm conscious of time and I, that, that's been really helpful. I, I really appreciate that. That was really clear. Cool. All right. Well, let's bring this call to an end. Um, I hope people have found real use from that. I will ask uh, Louise, I know Alan and Elaine, you guys have been sat quietly in the background and I've had a couple of messages, but Louise, what would you say you're, um, key thing that was really helpful for you on this call would be? I thought the whole call was really interesting, but obviously my question was about the Zort setup and stuff. So like, obviously I created MetaMask, but I didn't fully understand it. So even just the explanation of that and API, understanding the background of it, but just how to kind of get results up and running, connected to Binance and stuff has been really helpful. So I'm going to have a look at that and hopefully get it uh, working soon. Cool. Also, well, you're in the group as well. If you've got any help on it, let me know. Um, yeah. Like anything in any of these groups. Um, me and Rick, Richard do all of these calls and all of these programs just because we're really enjoying it. Um, we are have just finished off our nine-week crypto course now, uh, which we, is going to be open for anybody. Um, and it's kind of like a pay-what-you-feel um, gift donation-based sort of thing. We're just working that out now because we want to cover both sides of things but we're doing that so that we can at least point people to a structure because i think it would really help louise comes into the space we can go here go through this floor uh, and hopefully cover everything we cover about on these calls and then these calls can really be a bit more specific like we've done on this call as well so um really appreciate you guys showing up whether you're new faces old faces whether we have 20 in here or we have a smaller group uh, like today hope you all find it useful um, if you do know people, whether you're listening to this now or later on, that would find being in a supportive, helpful community in crypto useful and around sovereign finance, please do share the link. 
We're always interested in the group going. Other than that, we hope you have a wonderful day, evening, morning, wherever you are. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care, Thank everyone. You very much. See you later. Hey, guys. Bye-bye.